Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers and especially Nabil for inviting me here today to talk to you about the work we're doing at Agios um, to understand the role IDH mutations play in cancer. Um, and although my talk today is going to be focused on the preclinical and clinical work we're doing in AML, I will say what, what, what we're learning here um, in, this, uh, in, these, in this research is how IDH mutations really function to transform cells. And we also have a very active pro program in solid tumors. And um, Shoup uh, Saha from Nabil's lab will speak after me about some of the work we're doing in there as well. So here we go. Um, just as a brief background for what IDH mutations do, so isocitrate dehydrogenase is a metabolic enzyme that catalyzes the NADP-dependent oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, point mutations in IDH1 were first discovered in low-grade gliomas um, at a very specific arginine residue at this R132. Um, they were also found in IDH2 at a very, at the analogous um, residue R172. Um, and initially, um, these uh, mutations were thought to be loss of function, uh, well, they are shown to be loss of function mutations and were originally thought to be p potential tumor suppressors. Um, and this is corroborated with the work done by Hai Yan and published in New England Journal of Medicine. When isocitrate um, is converted into alpha-ketoglutarate, NADPH is produced. Um, and so using this assay um, and measuring NADPH production, you can see that IDH2 wild type or IDH1 wild type um, produce lots of NADPH. However, the mutant enzymes fail to do so. At Agios, we were interested in um, this mutation, first of all, because it's a metabolic enzyme. The company is founded to study metabolism as a novel mechanism to um, treat tumors. Um, but we were puzzled by the fact that L um, IDH mutations are always loss of heterozygosity and you never see um, complete loss. And so to me and to the company that really suggested that maybe this had actually a novel gain of function as opposed to a loss of function. And our biochemists were doing experiments similar to what I just showed you from Haiyan, where here you see the wild type protein. When you spike in the substrates, NADP and isocitrate, you get um, lots of NADPH produced. However, with the mutant enzyme, you start to see NADPH produce, produce, but then it's rapidly consumed. And every time they spiked in the substrate, you'd see this cyclic um, reaction. And this, again, supported the idea that potentially there was a novel mechanism or novel activity. At the same time we were studying um, uh, the IDH in the biochemical setting, we also overexpressed these mutant enzymes in U87 cells, that's the glioblastoma cell line, um, and looked at um, meta unbiased metabolic profiling. And what you see is a Western blot showing we had overexpression of the mutation. Um, and when we did this and performed FIATOF analysis, we had three metabolites that stuck out way high above all the others. And in fact, all three of these uh, metabolites, when we identified them, were actually 2-hydroxyglutarate. Um, and when we went back to look at the biochemistry, very similar to um, the wild type reaction, when you go from um, isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate in the forward, you produce NADPH by the, wild, uh, by the wild type enzyme and fail to do so by the mutant enzyme. But in the mutant reaction, what you do is actually consume NADPH. And this suggested that the enzyme was potentially running in reverse. And what we figured out was that um, instead of going from isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, the enzyme was now using alpha-ketoglutarate as a substrate, running a partial reverse reaction, um, consuming NADPH and producing this oncometabolite 2-hydroxyglutarate. And um, we were uh, accumulating millimolar concentrations of this. And this was all well and good. And we were seeing this in biochemical reactions, and we could see it in, um, in our cell systems. But the proof would be in the pudding when you looked in primary human patient tumors. So um, uh, I collaborated with uh, Linda Liao at UCLA, and she provided us with a group of low-grade gliomas that were blinded to us on their IDH mutational status. And we ran them over the LCMS. And there was 100% concordance with all the patients that harbored the IDH mutation had millimolar concentrations of 2-HG compared to those patients that were wild type. At the same time, uh, IDH mutations were being described in leukemia and AML, and what we found in blood samples, um, patients with an IDH1 mutation had elevated 2-HG in their blood um, as compared to patients that were wild type. 
And more recently, very elegant work um, that is ongoing at UT Southwestern, um, both at um, Memor uh, MGH and at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, they're using um, MR spectroscopy to be able to actually image 2-hydroxyglutarate. And this is very important um, to do so in the brain because we don't find 2-HG circulating in patient's plasma. And so um, it, we don't believe that 2-HG is able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So with all of this um, knowledge, we really do see 2-HG uh, localized in, uh, or found in all these IDH mutant tumors. And the question is, can it actually act as a surrogate for uh, treatment effect and actually um, potentially be a biomarker for clinical benefit? So this is a schematic of where IDH mutations are found. IDH1 mutations are often found uh, in uh, low-grade gliomas. You see 60 to 70 percent of patients with these tumors and secondary GBMs have um, IDH mutations. They're also found in chondrosarcomas, leukemias, uh, and cholangiocarcinomas, um, and a spattering of other uh, tumor types. And as more sequencing arises, we're picking them up more and more. IDH2 mutations are found uh, mostly in le leukemia um, and in hemato uh, hematologic disorders, um, as well as amino angioimmunoblastic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and again, we do see in cholangiocarcinoma as well. So I'm going to switch gears and talk to you about the preclinical work we've done in AML to decide uh, to understand what IDH does. Um, and so this is a breakdown of actually the IDH2 mutations versus the IDH1 mutations that are found. And what you see that the vast majority of IDH mutant cases have this R140Q mutation and um, uh, then the R172K. Or in the context of IDH1 AML, you see R132H or R132C. But the problem um, to, to begin these um, studies was that there are no endogenous cell lines that actually harbor um, IDH mutations. Um, so we had to engineer a system to, to be able to study um, uh, this for leukemia. So to do this, we use this TF1. Uh, it's an erythroleukemia cell line that's dependent on growth factors, GMCSF, for growth. And when we overexpress IDH1 or IDH2 in these cells, we were able to confer growth factor insensitivity. So um, this um, uh, showed us that these actually provided a gain of function to the cells, and it correlated nicely with the millimolar concentrations of 2-HG similar to what we see in patients. So before I go on, I'm going to give you guys a highlight of the mechanism um, uh, of what we believe may be happening. So um, as was talked about yesterday, um, alpha ketoglutarate dependent DNA and histone demethylases function to actually epigenetically regulate um, expression and gene transcription um, in order to promote normal cellular differentiation. So when these enzymes are active, you have demethylation on the DNA um, and leading to, um, to differentiation. When you have an uh, IDH mutation, you produce millimolar concentrations of 2-HG, which effectively, since this molecule is so similar to alpha ketoglutarate, effectively compete with AKG to bind into these histones, uh, DNA and histone demethylases, and functionally inactivate them, leading to a hypermethylation on the DNA and a block to cellular differentiation. Our inhibitors specifically target the mutant enzyme. We reduce 2-HG and then restore the activity of these DNA and histone demethylases and then um, restore the normal epigenetic uh, programming. So back to uh, our TF1 story, uh, focusing on the IDH2 mutation R140Q, I showed you earlier that it confers a growth factor independent growth in these cells, um, but we first wanted to see, using this model system, how similar it was to primary human patients that harbor the mutation. So we performed um, uh, Illumina arrays looking at the methylation status, and what we see here is that um, the patients with the IDH2 mutation, shown here with um, colored in red circles, have a very similar methylation pattern as our TF1 IDH2 mutant lines, <laughs> suggesting that we could use this system as a model to, to test some of the biological consequences. And one of the first things we noticed about what the happens to cells was actually a phenotypic morphology change. When we overexpress uh, IDH2 in the TF1 cells, TF1 cells are normally um, non-adherent cells. They float around in the dish. But when we express them, they started, the cells began to sit down on the plate and spread out. And this is more um, analogous to a mesenchymal phenotype or less differentiated. So we did a Western blot and looked at the expression of imentin, and what we found was that it was highly expressed in the R140Q cells compared to the vector alone. 
We also looked at cell surface markers and showed that um, CD38 and CD34, which are both expressed in the vector cells, um, we lose CD38 expression on the R140Q cells, and this is um, consistent with a less differentiated phenotype. So um, because we're a small mo molecule company, um, we are building inhibitors, obviously, to IDH1 and 2. Um, and this is one of our tool compounds, AGI6780. It's a potent uh, selective IDH2 R140Q inhibitor. Um, it's a slow type binding uh, uh, enzyme, uh, small molecule um, that binds in the allosteric pocket of the dimer interface of the enzyme. Um, and it's very potent, nanomolar potency against the mutant. So when we treated our TF1 cells, the first thing we looked at was the ability to change this hypermethylation phenotype, which I showed you before. And so here you see, um, if you compare a vector versus mutant, you see hypermethylation, and that upon compound treatment, um, we see um, uh, uh, seven days or 28 days, we see a reversal of some of the genes that have been hypermethylated. And when we do a gene set enrichment analysis of these, um, we find that the top scoring uh, genes pull up um, pathways that have been um, shown to play a role in AML, including the RUNX121 fusion, as well as in stem cell uh, phenotypes. We also looked at the histone hypermethylation, and we see that in the R140Q patient uh, sorry, cell line samples, we see hypermethylation at multiple K4, K9, K27, and K36 trimethylation compared to the vector. And when we treat with a compound and reduce 2-HG, we see a dose-dependent reduction in this hypermethylation. And we also see reversal of expression of vimentum. Um, so, but to look at the functional consequence of this um, hypermethylation, uh, reversal of the methylation phenotype, we also use these TF1 cells, and they're very um, uh, nice because when you treat with EPO um, in the vector cells, the cells turn bright red through the expression of hemoglobin. However, if you look at the mutant and cells, when those are treated with EPO, they fail to turn red because they can't go through their differentiation cascade. When we increase uh, our dose titrate in the compound, the inhibitor, we see a dose-dependent uh, increase in hemoglobin expression as well as KF1, which is a master regulator of erythropoiesis, again suggesting that the IDH mutation functions to block differentiation and that the inhibitor can reverse this. So we also um, wanted to take this one step further, and we collaborated with Stéphane Dubaton at Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris, and he provided us primary human patient samples um, that we treated ex vivo with the inhibitor. And what you see here, this is an example from two different patients, and when we do, we see a dose-dependent decrease in the um, production of 2-HG from both of these patients. And then we also looked at differentiation. So this is a fax analysis looking at the blast cells by CD45 expression. And in the middle panel and the far right, these are patients that have the R140Q mutation. And you can see that we reduce the number of blasts in both of these and fail to do so in the patients that are wild type. And we also see an increased expression of cell surface markers of, of granulocytic differentiation, such as CD11B, 15, and 14, specifically in the mutant patients and not in the wild-type patients, showing the specificity of the molecule. Again, now in primary human patient samples, blocking the production of 2-HG and restoring normal differentiation. Um, we also did a, a differential count. A pathologist who was blinded to uh, these samples counted the number of blast cells, myeloblasts, all the way up to metamyelocytes. And you can see in the mutant patient, we have a dose-dependent decrease in the number of blasts um, and not any in the, in the, primary, or in the wild-type patients. So with this information, we took, um, we went in to look at the effect of the compound uh, in um, primary, humans, uh, primary human xenograft. And now the data I'm going to show you is actually from AG221, which is our first in class molecule, which is in clinical trials right now for IDH2 mutant tumors. Um, so this molecule is a potent and reversible inhibitor of the IDH2 mutation. It has a greater potency on the R140Q than the 172K, but it's around 12 nanomolar. Um, it's selective against off-targets. It can induce differentiation in our TF1 system, similar to what I showed you earlier. It can also reduce, uh, induce differentiation in primary human blasts, which is shown up here, again, with Stefan. And we can see that we can reduce 2-HG in a U87R140Q xenograft model. Um, here showing that the compound, when the high levels of the compound are on board, you see a drastic reduction in the 2-HG, and that as the compound washes out after a single dose, you see the 2-HG begins to rise. So using this, we per, uh, performed in vivo studies with a primary leukemia xenograft model, 
and that is shown here. So um, this was a primary patient sample from an M5 leukemia that had um, all, a lot of genetic alterations, including the R140Q, a FLT3 mutation, a DMT3A, an MPM1, and a CBP alpha. Um, and the patient samples were banked, and then when we were ready to do the experiment, um, they were tail vein injected into recipient mice, and following um, uh, 40 days post um, injection, we see engraftment not only into the bone marrow of the CD45 positive human AML cells, but also into the spleen and the peripheral blood. And as we follow the 2-HG in the peripheral blood, you can see um, as the 2-HG uh, rises shown in black, you can see that correlates nicely with the increase in the CD45 positive tumor cells in the periphery. And the nice part about this model is that they very consistently, these animals um, succumb to their disease at day 79 um, when they reach about 60 to 70 percent engraftment. So doing this, we used AG221 in a single agent dose uh, um, efficacy study, 5 mg per kg, 15 mg per kg, or 45 mg per kg BID, um, and treated uh, compared to a low dose RSC standard of care. And this is the survival curve, and what we found was that we have a beautiful dose-dependent um, survival, and the animals at the highest dose actually had 100 percent survival um, compared to the vehicle or compared to um, the animals treated with RSC. And when we look at the bone marrow uh, for expression and differentiation, we see that the CD15 positive marker can be seen in both the peripheral blood and the bone marrow, and um, it's a dose-dependent increase in these differentiation. And interestingly, the animals that died in the low-dose group failed to go through this differentiation. And this is the differential count showing the dose-dependent decrease in the number of blasts, and this is the histology showing the um, maturation of these blasts into mature neutrophils. So with all of this um, data, we have moved into clinical trials with AG221, um, and um, um, this is the schematic for our summary for hematologic malignancies. We are in phase one dose escalation um, with a three plus three design. All patients enrolled are done so and must have uh, local documentation of an IDH2 mutation. Um, and the, obviously, we're um, assessing safety and PK and 2HG differentiation efficacy. We're also taking multiple um, biopsies that are used for exploratory endpoints, including running foundation medicine um, testing to look at global uh, uh, broad genomic changes so that we can track this with response. Um, and as we um, reach our MTD, we will move into multiple expansion cohorts with the potential for rapid entry into definitive trials. So this is the update that was given at ASH in December uh, last year um, um, uh, by uh, Eitan Stein and talking about our most recent uh, data from the clinical trial. So as I mentioned before, um, the trial is ongoing um, in IDH2 mutant positive hematologic malignancies, including relapse refractory AML, MDS, or untreated AML. Um, and is con um, con done in a continuous oral dosing QD or BID um, for 28 day cycles. And the key outcome measures, as I mentioned earlier, are safety and tolerability, and to define the dose limiting toxicities, the MTD, so we can move into a recommended phase two, um, assess the PK PD relationship, meaning 2HG, and characterize differentiation effect and look for signs of early preliminary, preliminary efficacy or clinical activity. Um, and um, that's just a FYI. So patient characteristics. Um, the average age of the patients is 67. Um, the diagnosis, as I said before, the majority are relapsed refractory or MDS. Um, and we have equal, approximately equal number of men and women and patients with have good ECOG performance status. Um, and the number of prior regimens um, the, for these patients with relapsed refractory, uh, the average is about two. Is two. Um, and some patients have had prior bone marrow transplants as well. So the safety summary to date, um, this therapy has been well tolerated. Um, we have not reached the MTD. Um, the most common um, adverse events include nausea, um, pyrexia, diarrhea, and fatigue. Um, and the majority of SAEs are actually disease related with the most being associated with either sepsis or differentiation syndrome. There have been 11 deaths reported, nine of which are unrelated acidosis, um, and two are possibly related, including se sepsis and uh, atrial flutter. So this is the PKPD from the trial. What we see is that there was excellent, excellent exposure of AG221, and we have high accumulation of after multiple doses, um, even um, 
uh, by day by cycle one day 15 we see um, that we have um, over succumb uh, or, uh, achieved uh, exposures that are greater than the uh, predicted efficacious exposure. Um, and when we look at the 2-HG, we see um, good 2-HG suppression as well, up to 98% in the patients that have the R140Q mutation. And this is the data so, uh, showing uh, the best overall response um, by cumulative daily dose. So there are 45 uh, patients that are valuable uh, for efficacy. Um, six of these patients have, achie have achieved a CR, complete remission. Four patients have a CRP, which is a complete response with incomplete platelet recovery. Uh, oh, sorry. Oops. Um, uh, four have a marrow CR, which means that they have blast less than 5%, but they have no hematologic recovery as of yet. Um, uh, one has a CRI, which is complete response but incomplete hematologic recovery. Um, Ten have a partial response, 17 with a stable disease, and two progressive disease. So um, the best overall response rate includes the CR, CRP, marrow CR, CRI, and PR, and that gives us 25 out of the 45 patients with an overall response rate. And this is a waterfall plot showing all 45 patients and the dur duration. But if you, um, well, I can focus here, there are 18 patients who are on study have been on greater than four months and 13 are ongoing. Six patients are on study for greater than six months um, and five responders have gone on to transplant. And this is a breakdown of the 25 best overall response. And what we see here is that um, we have an estimate duration of response of three months, which is um, pretty exciting for patients in this late line. Um, and very similar to what we saw in the preclinical models, um, we see inhibition of the mutation actually promotes appropriate cellular differentiation. So at screening, this is an example from one patient who achieved a CR. They have 40% blast. At, by cycle one, day 15, we can see uh, evidence of appropriate cellular differentiation here. And by cycle three, day one, this patient has only 4% blast and is considered a CR. And this is very different than standard of care therapies where you would ablate the, the marrow at this stage. So we're not um, just destroying the marrow, we're actually pushing it through to differentiation. And this is another patient, again, um, showing um, at cycle, uh, where they started AG221 at cycle one, day one. You see here they have a high white blood cell count, but these white blood cells are actually blasts. Um, by cycle one, day 15, we um, are beginning to see the increase in monocytes um, and a decrease in the blasts, and you can see that by fax analysis as well as cytology. And then by cycle one, day 28, we see um, the white blood cells now have um, matured. We're seeing the increase in um, nuclear neutrophils and monocytes and a decrease in the blasts. So um, the data I've shown you shows that um, AG221 is actually well tolerated in patients with advanced hematologic malignancies. Um, we can get good 2-HG suppression, um, and this is, the mechanism is very consistent with our preclinical models, leading to a decrease in 2-HG and the onset of differentiation. Um, the overall response rate is 25 out of 45, or 56 percent, um, and we have a durable um, response with patients on study as long as eight months. Um, we have dose expansions um, ongoing, and um, um, this data suggests that we should obviously keep going. <laughs> Um, and I'm not, I don't have time to talk to you about the IDH1, but I have one slide here to um, give you an overview. Um, we also have our first-in-class IDH1 mutant inhibitor, AG120. It's also in clinical trials, both in hematologic malignancies and solid tumors, including cholangiocarcinoma. Um, the preclinical data is very similar to what I showed you for IDH2. We can reduce 2-HG, induce differentiation in model systems and in primary patients. Um, and in the clinical um, data that was shown at EORTC in November, we see that um, to date the patient, the drug is well tolerated, um, and we also have not reached the MTD. We see good reduction of 2-HG, um, induction of differentiation, and the overall response rate is 7 out of 14 patients, including four complete remissions. Um, and um, we will begin those uh, expansions in, in 20, uh, this year. 
So we are uh, in clinical development for our AG221 as well as IDH1 in phase one with heme and solid. Um, and, you know, we're very excited about these data, and, and um, we've done a lot of work um, in our IDH1 space in solid tumor preclinical models, and we've published with Ingo Mellinghoff and glioma that um, in treatment with the IDH1 mutant inhibitors in solid tumors also induces differentiation, and Shoup is going to tell you the story we have uh, um, working with their group, and it's been a really great collaboration. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the group. Pretty, this is the whole company. <laughs> Uh, pretty much everybody at Agios touches uh, IDH at some point, um, but most of all, I really want to thank the investigators and obviously most importantly the patients who are very brave to go on this trial. So thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, obviously super exciting. Um, take questions from the audience. In blood malignancies, the response makes the marrow look more normal. In other words, it looks like the cells are differentiating. What's the analog to that in a solid tumor? What 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 happens to a solid tumor that uh, you, you know? Yeah, so that's a really good question, um, and, and Shoup will talk to this, some of the work, but from our glioma um, models and from other two systems in chondrosarcoma, we do see the onset of differentiation as well. We see markers of differentiation uh, coming up upon treatment. Um, again, how this is going to play out in solid tumors, the way, different than uh, liquid tumors, because a liquid tumor, as a cell differentiates, it has a finite lifespan, and so you can potentially clear the tumor. What that means for solid tumors in terms of shrinking a tumor is something um, that we are going to have to see. And on the trials, we're collecting biopsies all along the way and monitoring differentiation um, as well. Given the challenges that you have in getting tissue in solid yes. tumors, I wonder if you could comment on 2-HG as a, you know, uh, uh, tissue independent means of identifying those tumors you could treat. Yeah, so for sure 2-HG um, is, is definitely a biomarker of the IDH mutation. Um, and it is, um, we, can, we can screen patients for this, but our inhibitors are selective for IDH1 or IDH2, so you need to know the genetic um, so that you can pick which molecule to put the patient on. Um, the 2-HG, as I showed you, actually goes down very quickly upon compound treatment. So within 24 hours, 36 hours, you're down to baseline. So yes, you can use it as a target engagement and a PD for that. Um, and whether it tracks with efficacy is something we will, we will follow. Um, I apologize if you mentioned this, but touching again upon the mechanism of action, have you looked in preclinical models? D does the differentiation mechanism speak to potential or lack thereof for combination with cytotoxics? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a very good question to, in order to thinking about shrinking an actual tumor. Um, and so certainly that's something we're, we're looking into. I think what we're going to have to do is be careful about how you schedule and dose those together. Um, um, because as you push through the differentiation, um, you may actually sensitize yourself to a chemoagent or you could potentially desensitize it, and those are things that we're paying attention to. Uh, that was very nice uh, work presented. With leukemia, it's easier to get tissue, obviously. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, one of the things that was mentioned just before your talk uh, by, by uh, Dr. Isaacs was that you know, follow-up biopsies are not obtained. So, you know, while the uh, responses were quite impressive, you know, three-month median response is still quite short mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Uh, do you have any insights into what may be escape mechanisms or resistance mechanisms looking at follow-up evaluations? Yeah, so exactly. Those are all great questions. Um, so like I mentioned, we are taking biopsies all along the way to follow that and track. Um, if we see resistance come up, we are looking at um, gene expression profiling, next-gen sequencing, um, any kind of um, assays we can to understand what an escape mechanism might be. On solid tumors, I agree with you. I mean. I, I'm in charge of the translational research, so I'm excited with the heme because I can play all day, but the solid tumors, it's a lot m more challenging. So to get at that, we're looking at bio, uh, a circulating tumor DNA, also looking at um, um, potentially metabolism as a, as a readout, to how we alter the metabolism and how that could be picked up in the blood as a surrogate measure as well for a response. 
along the same lines, uh, my question is whether you're considering using methylation changes as a pharmacodynamic yeah. marker, especially circulating methylation yeah. assays. Yes, yeah, so we are doing that too. <laughs> um, so we're looking at bisulfide sequencing to look and see if you change methylation. We have immunohistochemistry set up for methylation changes, hydroxymethylation versus global methylation, um, as well as histone methylation changes. And do you know if the methylation changes are sustainable or are, are they reversed over time? Yes. Um, well, so in our preclinical models, we've seen it sustainable, um, and that's certainly something we'll watch if a patient relapses, you know, is it relapsing because of changes in methylation? And again, back to what, what we've seen over and over again is this theme of epigenetic co-drivers. And I'm actually a firm believer that that's probably one of the things that's the initiating event, but those also could be an escape mechanism to change that in a different pathway other than IDH. Great, thanks. Uh, Kate, do you have any hints about primary resistance? Any of the cooperating mutations? Yeah, um, so that's a great point. So all the patients, the pre-screen samples get sent for that. So um, if a patient doesn't respond up front, we are collecting all that information. So if we will establish primary resistance co-occurring mutations to help guide later enrollment on trials, as well as um, as they go, we do this called clonal evolution and follow it over time. And if you get secondary resistance, we'll, we'll map what those would be as well, thinking about combination strategies. Uh, okay, well, thanks so much, Kate. That yep. was great.